Welcome everyone to Managing Speech and Swallowing Problems in ALS. <clears throat> I wanna go over some housekeeping items before we begin our webinar today. And I also want you to know that you're muted and you're not on camera. So please relax and enjoy the presentation, which will last for about an hour. You'll notice a chat box to the right of your screen to enter questions. And we'll also have a question and answer session after the presentation. Lastly, please know that this program is being recorded and will be available to view on our website probably in the next few days or a week at most. So let's get started. I'm Nicole San Martino, Community Education Manager for the Les Turner ALS Foundation. Thank you for joining our ALS Learning Series with Kristen Larson. This webinar will discuss various ways ALS can impact your speech and swallowing. Kristen will focus on early identification of symptoms and provide helpful tips and techniques, including tongue and respiratory exercises, along with voice banking and communication aid options. Knowing what to expect as your symptoms change will help you make well-informed and timely decisions to communicate and swallow safely for as long as possible. Before I formally introduce you to Kristen, I would like to tell you a little bit about the foundation. The ALS Learning Series is made possible because of the Gilbert and Jacqueline Fern Foundation and our industry partners. We are leaders in comprehensive, personalized ALS care and research. We realize that people living with ALS may feel overwhelmed and unsure of what questions to ask and what to do next. The Les Turner ALS Foundation exists to care for those affected by the disease, guide them to answers, support them and their loved ones, and provide hope through scientific research. Our support services team is comprised of knowledgeable and compassionate nurses and social workers with many years of experience guiding people and their families affected by ALS. We offer a variety of services, including, but not limited to, care visits by our ALS support services coordinators, support group meetings, and educational material, materials and programs. At the Lois and Salia ALS Clinic at the Les Turner ALS Center, we offer access to enrollment in clinical trials and dedicated clinical trial coordinators. We are Chicagoland's first and largest multidisciplinary ALS clinic with the highest number of neurologists and dedicated pulmonologists. And we offer multidisciplinary care that brings together an experienced team of neuromuscular specialists in one clinic to provide comprehensive support to you and your family. Now I'm excited to introduce to you Kristen Larson. Kristen, Kristen received her both her Bachelor of Science and her Master's of Arts degrees in speech language pathology from Northwestern University. She is currently the Assistant Director of Northwestern University Speech Pathology Clinical Program on the Chicago campus and is an Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders of Northwestern University. Kristen's clinical and research interests include speech and swallowing disorders in ALS and other progressive neurologic diseases, as well as the management of complex dysphagia. She has served as one of the two primary speech language pathologists in the Lois and Salia ALS Clinic at the Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern Medicine for the last eight years. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Kristen Larson. Hello. Um, it is so nice to be here with everyone today um, talking about, whoops, hang on, I gotta get my slides up. There we go. Um, talking about how we manage speech and swallowing problems in ALS. Now, I've got a lot of material to cover today, so I'm gonna try to kind of keep this going at a decent clip. Please, please, please use the chat box if you have any questions. I'm going to leave some time at the end to talk about you know, answering some of the questions that you may have. I know that with ALS, speech, communication, and swallowing issues um, can be you know, scary and a big problem. So this is something that I wanna take the time to really kind of explain 
what sort of changes we may expect to see and what we can do about those things. All right, so today I want to be able to, I want everyone to be able to identify signs of early speech disturbances in ALS, describe some compensatory techniques that may help to facilitate improved communication as the disease progresses, identify some common swallowing impairments in ALS, and describe behavioral interventions for these swallowing impairments. You know, what can we do to help this along? Um, and then discuss the role of exercise in managing speech and swallowing problems. We're gonna start by talking about speech production, right? Um, speech and swallowing are two things that we basically just do without really thinking about how complicated the processes are. When we think about speech production, the basis for all of our speech production is respiration, okay? It's our breathing. We know that in ALS, we can have issues with breathing, with diaphragm weakness. Um, so this is sort of the foundation of your speech production, right? When we take a when we take a breath in, okay, our diaphragm contracts, it pulls our lungs down, creates a negative pressure, so our lungs fill with air. Then when we're going to talk, we're talking on that exhalation, all right? The air is moving from our lungs up through our trachea, and it's passing through our vocal cords, all right? That brings us to the phonation part of this, all right? As air passes through your vocal cords, your vocal cords are vibrating at a certain frequency that produces your voice. So we already know we can have impaired respiration or airflow. We can also have issues at the levels of the vocal cords, whether they're kind of working too hard when they shouldn't be and making kind of a tight, more pressed sounding speech, or whether they're not getting as much air coming through them, which can make the speech sound weaker or softer. Right? Once this air passes through our vocal cords and our vocal cords folds vibrate and produce sound, that sound then moves up through our mouths and is shaped into you know, recognizable speech by our different articulators. Now your articulators are things like your lips, your tongue, your jaw. All of these structures move with a very you know, precision and a, a amount of force to make the sounds clear and precise. Any change in the weakness or the movement of these articulators can result in speech that's not as clear. Another aspect of our speech production is resonance, kind of the sound of your voice. Uh, sometimes with ALS, we can get weakness in the palate so that it doesn't close off like it should when we make most consonant sounds like P's and T's and K's. Um, we want some airflow into our nose for nasal sounds like M's and N's and some vowels. We don't want nasal sounds, you know, for these you know, nasal airflow for these other sounds. So again, this can impact the way our speech sounds. We know that every one of these components can be affected during the course of ALS. Okay, so let's talk about what are some of the early signs of speech involvement in ALS. Oftentimes people may complain that they have a slower speech rate. Still sounds like them, but it just feels like everything's slowing down a little bit. We might notice some imprecise or slurred speech. Sometimes this may start only at certain times of the day, maybe towards the end of the day, if you've had a busy day, you've been talking a lot, you may start noticing that speech is a little less precise. You may notice, again, relating to that respiratory difficulty, that you may have difficulty speaking loudly or projecting your voice to be heard across the room. Sometimes we can find that we're getting changes in our voice quality. It's a little hoarse, it's a little strained, a little raspy quality. You may feel as if you're running out of breath when you're speaking, which can lead you to use shorter phrases. Sometimes what we find is towards the end of a sentence, if we're running out of breath, we may get a little more of that strain. And we may just find that you're getting more tired when you're speaking, you know? So what used to be normal, is now kind of wearing you out a little bit more. I kind of want to talk a little bit about why these things are happening. 
All right, so we know with ALS, there's both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron involvement. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that is affecting speech. With upper motor neuron involvement, what we can see is some spasticity or rigidity in these bulbar muscles. Now the bulbar muscles are the muscles involved in your, you know, kind of like your, basically your mouth and your throat. So we can get a little bit of spasticity or rigidity here. That can lead to sort of this reduced speed or rate of speech. We can get some hyperadduction. What that means is basically those vocal cords are closing when they shouldn't be, all right? That can lead to kind of that strained, strangled vocal quality. We can get some emotional ability, what we call pseudobulbar affect. Now, sometimes that may mean, you know, you may just laugh or cry a little bit more easily than you used to. If that progresses, that can actually impact your intelligibility and really interfere with speech production. We can also see some hypernasality we talked about before and reduced vocal inflection. So the pitch range can be a little bit reduced and you don't have that, you know, sort of the liveliness in your speech. Now, as we talk about more of the lower motor neuron pathways, this is where we're talking about that muscle weakness, all right? We talk about this bulbar atrophy. So that's when the tongue and lip muscles can get weaker. They don't move as much as they used to. They don't move as strongly as they used to. That can result in slower, imprecise, or slurred articulation. Kind of that need to kind of chalk in shorter phrases. If we have that velopharyngeal incompetency or palatal weakness, that can result in this hypernasality or if it really progresses, even some nasal air emission where you hear kind of airflow coming out your nose as you're talking. If our articulators like our lips and tongue aren't hitting their targets with the amount of strength or force that they used to, we can kind of see just this you know, more um, softening of the speech, that slurred quality. Uh, fasciculations are something that we sometimes see in the tongue where it's this sort of, uh, you know, kind of a, a writhing or rapid little movements on the surface of the tongue. This can be a sign that we're getting muscle weakness or atrophy. Sometimes we notice that there's a decreased gag response or an absent gag response. In some cases, we may see a hyper gag response that may be gagging when you're brushing your teeth. And again, we can see that reduction of movement of the vocal cords, which may result in a weaker voice or a soft voice, what we call hypophonia. You may get that breathy, hoarse quality because we're not getting as much movement of the vocal cords. Now, what is the role of the speech therapist? So when you're noticing these problems, you know, any changes in your speech, uh, I would definitely recommend that you talk with a speech therapist. What we will do is we're going to evaluate uh, your overall communication skills. What's going on with your speech? Are you using any other ways to communicate? Uh, how are we doing cognitively? Are you having any trouble thinking of the words you wanna say or remembering things? That's always gonna be part of a, a speech communication evaluation so we can really get a big picture of everything that's affecting your communication. The management here is really focusing on assessing where you're at now, being able to anticipate changes before they come so that we can implement interventions and different strategies at the right time. We want to you know, keep your verbal communication strong for as long as we possibly can, because we all know that talking you know, by mouth, the normal way you talk, is the easiest way to communicate. And we wanna be able to facilitate that, you know, for as long as possible. Um, early on, we may introduce the concept of voice or message banking. We're gonna talk about that a little more in a few minutes. Um, as the communication issues may progress, we're gonna look and see, okay, we're using the speech strategies. Maybe they're not enough at a certain point. What else can we do? Do we need to use an alternative communication option or augment what we're doing? And again, I'll talk about some different low-tech, medium-tech, high-tech um, approaches to this. 
One of the most important things that we do as speech pathologists working with people with ALS is collaborate and communicate with everyone on your healthcare team. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how so much of what we do as speech therapists interplays with our, our neurologists, our pulmonologists, our dietitians, occupational therapists. We really do work as a team to make sure that we are optimizing the quality of your life. Uh, so that's one of our main goals. When we do a speech evaluation, one of the most important things we're gonna do is get a really good history from you. Who knows your speech better than you or your family members? Um, what are the things that you've been noticing about your speech? When did you start noticing them? So you can kind of get an idea for how fast this may be progressing. Um, how are you communicating now? You know, is speech sufficient? Is it okay? Are you starting to write things down because people can't understand what you're saying? Where are we at now? We're gonna take a really good look at the muscles in your face and in your mouth so we can see what the range of motion looks like. Are we getting full range of motion? Is the strength starting to be impaired so we're not quite hitting the targets with as much force as we want? What's going on with the palate? All right, these are the things we're gonna look at. What does your voice sound like? Do we have a good pitch range? How long can you sustain an ah? All right, that tells us a little bit about your breath support for your speech. How intelligible is your speech at this time? What sort of things do you do to make yourself sound better? Um, is the speech slow? Is it too fast? Are we stumbling over words? These are all the things that we're gonna take into account as we figure out what is an individualized plan to help facilitate the best communication we can get. I'm gonna talk a little bit about voice and message banking now. Now, one of the things that um, you can do to kind of take some control here is record your voice while your voice still sounds really strong and ideally as normal as possible. Now, we will try to bring up the concept of voice and message banking as early as possible in the disease process before your speech intelligibility or voice quality deteriorates because we want to get a really clear recording. And for people who are interested in voice or message banking, we want to do this while your voice still sounds like you. Uh, a lot of times people will sort of wait or put it off and then either their speech has deteriorated or their voice may have changed a little bit. It doesn't quite sound like them or it might get really fatiguing to do these recordings. So again, this is why it's really important to get going on something like this early. There are a lot of different programs that are available for people with ALS. Your speech in a nutshell is recorded and then stored away until you may need to have it uploaded to a speech generating device for SGD. People do recordings themselves. They also have certain platforms have similar voices in a voice bank you can pick a voice from. You can have a family member who may sound like you do your recordings for you. All right, there's a lot of different things. Uh, cost of these programs is variable. Support is available through the Gleason Foundation. So that is a very important note on this. Um, so there is support available for these and the Gleason Foundation is fantastic. All right, talking a little bit more here. Message banking, what is it, okay? Message banking is recording yourself saying something meaningful in your own voice, okay, in its entirety. So it may be you saying, I love you, or hey there, Johnny, or telling your favorite joke. Saying things that are kind of quintessentially you in your own voice, in your own prosody, all right? At some point in time, should you need to use a speech generating device, we upload these phrases. And again, like I said, it's not modified, it's you talking and recording it. There are websites that help set this up for you. One of them is www.mymessagebanking.com. Voice banking, on the other hand, is a process where you record a specific number of sentences or phrases. And that again, all these, all these sentences are recorded, they're stored, and they are uploaded in the future so that you will be able to utter novel utterances. So something you've never said before, you didn't record that sentence, 
but it'll be produced in a synthesized voice that is based on your recordings. And there are lots of different programs for this. Your speech therapist can help kind of guide you in this. Again, not everybody is interested in doing voice banking or message banking, but we put it out there because we know that you may have progressive problems with speech. Um, I will say this, with bulbar onset disease, it is important to do this as quickly as possible because we know that with bulbar onset disease, again, that's where it's starting with speech, swallowing, we know that we may have deterior, you know, fairly rapid deterioration in the quality of your speech and the intelligibility. With more limb onset, we may have a little more time, but we can still get some changes in the voice quality, your ability to project your voice. So again, if this is something that you're interested in, it's something I would ask a speech therapist about, pursue this sooner rather than later. Now, when we talk about early problems with speech, what are the things that you can do to make your speech sound better, okay? Slow down. And even if one of the problems with your speech is that it's a little bit slow to begin with, don't try to rush it, okay? When we rush the speech, we're gonna have more issues with the clarity, all right? Keep it slow. Try to pause between your words. As intelligibility gets compromised, sometimes words can run together. So the more you get used to pausing between your words, the easier it is to understand them. This may necessitate using shorter sentences or phrases to increase the clarity. And I say slight over-articulation, exaggeration, enunciation, however you wanna think about it, being a little bit more deliberate with your articulation. That's gonna help your articulators, your lips, your tongue, your jaw, get to the places they need to get with a little bit more force. Sometimes if you're able, increasing your loudness can improve your intelligibility. Oftentimes, and we talked about that respiratory support, if the problem is running out of breath or maybe getting that increased strain towards the end of a sentence, getting into the habit of taking a deep breath before you speak and again as needed, all right? Make sure that you have enough breath to support the sentences that you're trying to get out. Some of the things we can do, don't even take effort on our, uh, on our own part. Modify the environment, all right? Make sure that when you're having a conversation, you're in a quiet room. Turn off the TV. Don't be talking while you're doing the dishes with the sink running, okay? Face to face. I think um, one of the things that, you know, the world with masks and COVID taught us is that it can be a lot harder to understand somebody when their mouth is covered. So always being able to look at someone's face and watch their mouth, that can help us to be able to be understood better. Um, sometimes, you know, having an alert system so that if you need to get someone's attention and they're in another room, that can be, you know, like fancy buzzers and things that we can order online, can be a bell. There's a lot of different things we can use as an alert system to get someone's attention in another room. That way they can then come into the room and you can have that conversation face to face. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but whenever some of the problems are, um, you know, kind of either some of the spasticity or strain, uh, increased difficulty pr um, projecting your voice, anything that's related to the volume or the breath support, make sure that you are talking with your pulmonologist and we're maximizing your respiratory support and airway clearance so we don't have saliva or secretions also contributing to this communication, you know, decrease speech clarity, all right? Mm -hmm. So maximizing respiratory support is always one of the first things that I wanna make sure is going on before we introduce strategies or as we introduce strategies. Okay, so there are some low tech interventions that, you know, we, we've implemented our speech strategies. They're working fairly well, but at some point, Oh, people still aren't understanding you, even if you're repeating yourself slowly and deliberately. Then we might need to do something where, oh, we keep a notebook handy, so we uh, just jot something down if someone didn't understand it. We may use a write-on board. You 
can write something either with a pen or like a stylus, and then you, know, you press a button, it goes away, you start a new message. We can use something low tech like an alphabet board. Got a couple more here. So sometimes with alphabet boards, sometimes it can be as simple as you point to the first letter. Oh, it's an S. Oh, you're saying Susie. Okay, got it. All right. Sometimes that can help. Sometimes you may need to spell out the word. If you can point, great, you can point to the letters and spell something out. If you cannot, we can use something called partner assisted communication, where you and your communication partner are both looking at a communication board and your partner may say, is it in the first, is the first letter? Is it in the first line, second line, third line? Okay, it's in the third line. Is it an I, a J, a K? It's a K. So we can spell things out that way. It's slower, but if once you kind of get in the habit of using it, can really help with communication. Uh, communication boards can also be customized. We can have pictures, things that are relevant to you, things you would need to identify frequently. Okay, so these are just some examples of low tech. Okay, there's also some interventions that we can use for accessibility. Um, you're gonna hear me talk a lot about text to speech, where we type something out, press a button, and it says it out loud. There's also speech to text. So for somebody who has relatively intact speech, but may not be able to use their hands, there are a lot of different things you can use to be able to access your computer by dictating to it, all right? There are different voice activated platforms out there now for your phone, you know, we've got Hey Siri, um, and then for controlling things within the house, lights, timers, your television, um, you know, the Google Home Assistant, Alexa, all those different things are out there now. Technology has come a long way here. When we talk about other types of technology that we can use, if your articulation is fairly intact, you just have trouble projecting your voice, using something like an amplification device can be really easy. Little headset that you wear, you can talk, it's attached to an amplifier that will amplify the sound of your voice. This can be good for people who get tired with conversation because they're really struggling to project their voice. Again, we have this text to speech. You would type something out, press a button, it'll say it out loud. We have text to speech apps that you can use on your phone, on a tablet, on your computer, things that can make uh, you know, communication a lot easier. A lot of these apps have word prediction, so you don't have to type out the entire word. It'll start suggesting words with just a few letters. They also almost all have the ability to pre-program phrases. So things that you say frequently, type it in ahead of time. All you have to do is navigate to that page, select it, and, and press the button to speak it. So these are things that are fairly accessible for most people. When we get into more high tech, so these are when we get into more of a dedicated speech generating device. These are things that may be accessed through touch, like typing, or running up the gamut to being able to access a keyboard by using your eye gaze, looking at it, having it register. These are things that take a little bit of practice. You would work with a speech therapist, uh, have an evaluation, perhaps trial some different devices, uh, I'm not going to get into this a ton because I believe next month we've got some of uh, my colleagues, my occupational and speech therapy colleagues from the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab over in the Tech Center will be doing another talk on this. If this is something you are interested in, I highly encourage you to watch that. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about swallowing. I encourage any of you, if you have questions about speech, please put it in the chat box now so that we can circle back to that at the end of the session. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about swallowing, right? Now, as we all know, for most of us, eating and drinking is a highly pleasurable experience, right? Most of us enjoy eating. It's very social, right? So it's not just about getting nutrition. Um, we go out to dinner, we meet up with friends over, you know, lunch or dinner or drinks, um, it's oftentimes how we sort of chunk our days, you know, 
like you have breakfast, then you do some stuff, then you have lunch, then you do some stuff, then you have dinner. Um, so it's it's a familiar routine for all of us. And when that is disrupted, it can be really stressful and upsetting. Um, so again, our, our goals here are to maximize swallowing, to make it as normal as possible so that you can continue to enjoy the foods and liquids that you enjoy for as long as we possibly can, safely. The key there is safely. Okay, so now you know, I, I believe in kind of you know, making sure you understand everything that I'm talking about as I talk about strategies. So I want you to understand what actually happens with swallowing because like with speech, we typically don't think about it. Put something in our mouth, things take over, we swallow. Um, swallowing is actually divided into four stages. All right, you've got your oral preparatory stage, your oral stage, your pharyngeal stage, and your esophageal stage. In the oral prep stage, that's when you take, you take that bite of steak, you put it in your mouth, your lips are gonna close to keep it in, your tongue is gonna move around the way it's supposed to, to move it in and out of your teeth in this kind of lateral rotary movement so that we can chew that and make it into what we call a bolus or a little food blob so that we can swallow it down. Right? Um, particularly with bulbar onset disease, we may start seeing some early changes in that oral preparatory stage. Once we have prepped this food into that nice little blob and are ready to swallow it back, it goes into that oral stage, oral transit, where basically our, we need our lips to stay closed, our tongue needs to move in a coordinated fashion to grab that bolus of food, move it back to our throat. Once it's in our throat, there's a lot of different things that happen, okay? Um, when you are you know, normally sitting around, you've got two tubes in your throat. Your airway's in the front, your esophagus is right behind it. When you are talking and breathing, your airway is wide open, your esophagus is closed. When we go to swallow, we move the food back into our throat. Parts of our brain should take over at this point. They sense the food is coming, they send a message to the airway to close fast and tightly, and send a message to all of the muscles in our throat to kind of sequentially squeeze so that we get the food down into our esophagus. Once we're done with that, airway is wide open again, esophagus closes again. A lot of things can go wrong here with that timing of that response to get that airway closed quickly, with the muscle strength to close the airway completely, with the muscle strength at the back of our tongue, at the back of our throat, um, to really squeeze and get that, that good muscular squeeze that it takes to swallow different viscosities of food and liquid. Um, and then the food will move into our esophagus. I'm not gonna get into that. That's more GI and gastroesophageal and not really of our concern right now. When we're doing a swallow evaluation, again, first part of it is a, an, an interview. So I'm gonna ask what, what sort of things are you eating and drinking now? What sort of things are hard for you to eat and drink? Are you avoiding anything because you've discovered it's too hard to eat and drink it? Um, we will oftentimes do a rating scale in clinic. We typically use one called the EAT-10 which asks a lot of questions about um, weight loss. You're, do you change anything if you're eating in front of people? Does it take you a lot of effort to swallow liquids or solids or pills? Um, are we having any coughing with meals? Are you uh, feeling like food or liquid is sticking in your throat? Um, and are you stressed out by swallowing? Is it affecting your pleasure in, in eating? So we kind of will run through a list of these things and then kind of flesh out where you tell us you're having problems, and then try to figure out what we can do to manipulate um, you know, these different factors to ideally let you be able to continue eating the foods you like. All right. um, you know, at the end of the day, I might you know, say, okay, this is you're coughing and choking every time you're eating this, maybe we eliminate this food. But before that, we're gonna really try to listen to you because that's, Kind of one of the most important that is the most important thing here what do you enjoy um and how how can i suggest modifications that are going to help you continue to eat the foods and drink the liquids that you enjoy um putting that under the lens of making sure that it is safe for you and it's still pleasurable 
uh, coughing and choking throughout a meal tends to not be pleasurable. We want to minimize that, avoid it, if at all possible. Um, when you see a speech therapist, again, we're going to do that oral motor assessment. We're going to see how everything's moving in your mouth. We may do a clinical swallow evaluation where we give you things to eat or drink. Maybe just want you to drink a little bit, whatever you're having trouble with. We may determine if you need a more, uh, what we call an instrumental swallow evaluation. So more of a diagnostic test. We can do this in radiology, which is a video fluoroscopic swallow study, or we can do something where we pass a little endoscope through your nose and kind of watch your throat as you eat. The flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. I'm gonna show you really briefly what we're talking about here. All right, so this is just a little snippet of a normal video fluoroscopic swallow study. So I want you to just look at the movements here. I'm gonna play a little snippet here. Think about how complicated all these movements are for swallowing. All right, that happened pretty fast. And that, that bolus, that's the liquid bolus there, went down perfectly. There's nothing left over and nothing went into the airway. That's what we want to see. A little bit of an endoscopic view. This is what we see when we pass a scope through your nose and take a look. What you're looking at here is this is uh, the back of your epiglottis, a little cartilage. These are your vocal cords and that's looking straight down into someone's airway. The entrance to the esophagus is in the back. What we do is we give people some food or liquid that's dyed, we dye it a bright green so we can see it. And we wanna see, that's a little bit, and that's after the swallow. There's a little left over there and yet this person cleared it beautifully. So this is another example of how we can assess follow function. So again, we're gonna evaluate. We're gonna look at either clinically, just up in a clinic or at the a bedside if you're in the hospital or in the speech therapist's office. We may do a diagnostic study. We may teach you some compensatory swallowing techniques or strategies. I'm gonna talk about some of these in a minute. We may suggest diet modifications to make you know, continued oral intake safe and pleasurable. We're gonna introduce some exercises if indicated and appropriate. Our goals here are to minimize the risk of aspiration. Aspiration is food or liquid going below the vocal cords down towards your lungs. The risk there is developing a pneumonia. We do not want that. We want you to maintain safe oral intake. We wanna anticipate changes that may come with your swallowing. So that's why it's important to check in with a speech therapist or your physicians periodically. So we're tracking how you're doing with your swallow. We wanna implement interventions uh, that can help you eat, you know, again, a wider, as wide of a variety of foods as possible, as long as possible. We work closely with your other care providers, your physicians, you know, pulmonologists, neurologists, or dietitians, um, occupational therapists, to help make sure that eating and drinking is as smooth as possible. All right, so we kind of talked about a lot of the different involvement we see that affects the speech. Hey, a lot of these same things are gonna affect your swallow in related ways. If we get lip weakness, sometimes we can't close our lips entirely to suck through a straw or seal around a cup or keep our lips closed while we're chewing and swallowing. Sometimes we get a little spillage out the front. Um, you know, if we have spasticity or weakness in these movements of the jaw and the tongue and the lips, that can cause us difficulty with chewing. Swallowing and chewing can get fatiguing. You may not wanna eat that chewy food and instead, you know, the yogurt and scrambled eggs are sounding a lot better. We can see changes in the strength of the tongue, right? That's gonna be a decreased lingual pressure. Um, you know, decreased ability to control that food, move it back. All right, sometimes there'll be leftover in your mouth. Sometimes it sticks along the sides. Sometimes it's along the roof of your mouth because the tongue isn't strong enough to clear it. And it can take longer to eat because it's taking longer for you to prep the food and move it back. Again, sometimes we see that that palate is not sealing completely. Now, when you swallow, that needs to seal so that nothing goes up your nose. Sometimes we'll see a little bit creeping up in the back. That closure is also important for being able to generate pressure to really squeeze all the food down. If we have weakness or spasticity in any of these throat or pharyngeal muscles, 
we may have stuff left over in your throat. All right. And you may have that sensation of something sticking in your throat. Um, if the vocal cords are weak or there's reduced coordination because of reduced breath support, or maybe you're taking breaths more frequently than you did before, we may have incomplete or incoordinated closure of the airway that allows us to swallow safely. This is particularly important when it comes to swallowing liquids. All right, we need that really fast, really tight closure of the airway to prevent any liquids from squeezing down the wrong way. Um, again, we can see weakness or spasticity of these respiratory muscles, and that affects our ability to coordinate the breathing and that closure for swallowing. It also may affect our ability to generate a <coughs> good, strong cough. Cough is a very protective feature when we're talking about swallowing. If we are gonna have any aspiration, food or liquid down the wrong pipe, we wanna make sure that we have a good, strong way of clearing it. So whether that's a strong cough or a forceful <coughs> throat clear, we wanna try to make sure that we can help that response so that we can protect our airway. All right. When we think about swallowing, we want to think about the efficiency. You know, how long is it taking you to eat a meal? Is it hard to move the th food through your mouth? Is the food getting stuck in your throat? Um, you know, and nutritional efficiency. Are you able to maintain your caloric intake? As we know, if anyone watched the uh, last month's webinar with our dietitians, um, you know, we get into we can get into a hypermetabolic state with ALS, which means you need more calories. If we're having any issues with swallowing, it may make it harder to get the calories that you need. Um, we wanna think about safety, all right? Is something getting in laryngeal penetration, is, is something getting into the top of your airway? That can make you cough too. Are we having aspiration? Um, the sensory response, do you feel it if it's stuck in your throat? Do you feel it if it goes down the wrong pipe? And if so, <laughs> what's our cough integrity? Can we clear it? That's really important too. Um, are you just having one problem or are you having problems with your lips and the timing and food sticking? All of these things are going to affect, you know, just the overall safety and efficiency of your swallow. Now, when we think about if we're having trouble with liquids, what are some of the things we want to look for here? How do we, how do we maintain hydration? You want to be careful with thin liquids, all right? Thin liquids, water, coffee, soda, they, they move very fast. Now, when I talk about how we need that airway to close really quickly, if it's even slightly slow, a fraction of a second, the liquid can fall down into the throat, the airway may not be closed yet, that can result in a few drops down the wrong pipe, which can cause a big coughing fit. All right. Sometimes postural changes can be effective. Using a chin tuck may put your airway in a slightly more protected position and help swallow thin liquids. It doesn't work for everybody, it really depends on the individual physiology or what the inside of your throat looks like. Um, sometimes we may need to have supplemental hydration. If thin liquids become very difficult, sometimes people may find that it's easier to supplement by using a feeding tube, a gastric tube, uh, and taking some of their water through that. Sometimes thicker liquids, they move more slowly, they're not as likely to get into the entrance of the airway, can be helpful. Now you can add thickening powders to any liquids to make them thicker. Uh, some people are okay with that texture. Some people absolutely hate the thicker liquids using the powders. I often suggest trying different types of naturally thicker liquids uh, like yogurt drinks, like kefir, uh, fruit nectars, smoothies, milkshakes. Um, and there are easier ways that we can manipulate how you're drinking. Uh, if, it's, if you're getting some spillage drinking from a cup, maybe a, a straw or a, a wide straw or a shorter straw, uh, special cups that have like a little bit more of a narrowed entrance can help you control the liquids better. There are just a couple examples of different types of cups. And depending on what your individual problems are, we can kind of brainstorm um, to figure out something that's gonna work well for you. Now, when we talk about solid foods, first of all, we do need to make sure that we're ensuring the appropriate consistency, all right? If your tongue's not working well and you're really not able to chew efficiently, eating a big bite of steak, probably not the best idea, all right? Appropriate size of the bites, okay? So maybe this means 
Maybe you can still enjoy some of those more challenging foods, but let's cut them small so that you have less work to do with your tongue to try to chew the foods. Okay. Um, sometimes using strategies like alternating bite of food, sip of liquid to help clear it. Bite of food, sip of liquid. Increasing the effort for those foods that are a little more challenging just by giving a little extra squeeze as you swallow. Sometimes we may need to swallow multiple times to get something down. If meals are fatiguing, eating smaller, more frequent meals can be really useful. Um, something I always tell people, and the dietitians mentioned it last month as well, is that, you know what, if there's a food that you like that you know is challenging, maybe we take a smaller portion of that, or cut it into as manageable pieces as we can, and then you balance out the rest of your meal with things that are easier to swallow. Right. Um, especially for people who have difficulty with limb movement and have to be fed by someone else, let's really make sure that we're, we're you know, respecting the person who's being fed, all right? I want you to feel comfortable saying, hey, that's too fast, slow that down, I need more time. Um, you know, offering food, liquid to wash it down. So let's really try to, you know, figure out when we feed ourselves, we do these things naturally. When someone else is feeding you, it gets a little more complicated. So have that discussion, have ongoing discussions to make sure that, you know, you're feeding at a good rate. You know, if you're the one being fed, give that feedback, all right? Um, also important to get good dental care, maintain good oral hygiene. You should be brushing your teeth at least twice a day, all right? Brush your tongue as well. We wanna minimize the amount of bacteria in your mouth because if there is any aspiration, anything getting down the wrong pipe, we don't want it picking up a bunch of bacteria as it goes through your mouth and then bringing that down to your lungs. So good oral hygiene is really important. Um, talked about uh, different types of cups and straws. You can also consult with your, our occupational um, therapy colleagues for adaptive equipment that can help, you know, if we're getting a little bit of weakness in our hands, if built up utensils, plate, plates that may have like ridges or, you know, um, you know, compartments that make it easier to pick up the food. So it helps you be able to feed yourself longer. Okay, so we always get this question, what sort of exercises can I do? Now, historically with ALS, we tend to talk about compensations, all right? We know it's progressive, we know the muscles are getting weaker. Um, so we talk a lot about conserving your energy, conserving your effort. And that is, there's definitely a place for that. We're starting to look at, okay, now, are there, is there anything that we can do that can improve this function, all right? And there is, there is evidence that certain types of exercise may help kind of prolong or maintain your function longer and prevent some disuse atrophy, all right? So not using it. Um, one of the most important things to keep in mind, exercises should be started early in the disease course to get the most likelihood of benefit. Have clear expectations. Exercises, you know, doing tongue exercises is not going to reverse any muscle weakness or atrophy, and it is not going to prevent eventual disease progression. Exercise should be done in moderation, all right, never to the point of fatigue or exhaustion. And I always tell people to avoid repetitive drill type exercises as they may cause fatigue with no real gain. What I mean by this, um, is, you know, people will come in and be like, oh, I'm working with someone and they tell me, I read all these lists of, of words and I repeat them again and again and again. Okay, well, so now you just repeated a bunch of words. We probably fatigued your tongue and now you wanna have a conversation with your family and you're tired and your speech is more slurred. So again, I, I'm not a fan of repetitive drill type exercises. Uh, something that's kind of, uh, getting a lot of attention these days in the exercise ALS swallowing world is expiratory muscle strength training or EMST. Now you get a little device and it requires forceful exhalation into a one-way spring-loaded valve. Essentially it's got a little mouthpiece on it, you blow really hard, all right? It's tightened incrementally to kind of increase the resistance as you are able to do one level, we tighten it a little bit more. It can strengthen uh, these recruited muscles, these expiratory muscles over time, all right? The idea is to try to make it so that we get improvement in cough strength. 
So that's kind of one of the big goals. Um, there is some research on this that shows some promise. Um, kind of included a little bit of data here. Uh, what we saw was that there was an increase in max expiratory pressure in the patients who were using an active device versus a sham device or a fake device and had some improvement in the functional oral intake score uh, versus a decline in a group who didn't have any therapy. The functional oral intake score basically measures like how many consistencies of food are you able to eat comfortably. They didn't see any differences in laryngeal penetration or aspiration, um, the E10, that rating scale score, or any cost spirometry measures. So, you know, again, some promise, kind of needs a little bit more research and we still need to keep looking at this. Uh, a lot of people will be doing tongue exercises or lingual resistance exercises, either with a tongue bulb or with a tongue depressor. The research for this is not exhaustive. Um, there's not a lot of large scale studies, mostly some case reports. Most of the studies that look at exercise in ALS are based on basic science or limb exercise data. Something we need to keep in mind when we're talking about speech and swallowing or this bulbar musculature is that these muscles are never really at rest. We use them all the time. You're talking, you're chewing, you're swallowing your saliva. Um, you know, so just by being, <laughs> we're using these muscles. Uh, evidence does suggest that exercise, including tongue exercises, may be beneficial in delaying disease progression if done early and in moderation. And I think that's like my biggest takeaway for these type of exercises. Okay, the one thing that I really will advocate to almost everybody, <laughs> lung volume recruitment or breath stacking. Uh, Dr. Coleman talked a lot about this in his talk a couple months ago, and most of this slide is uh, gratuitously plagiarized from Dr. Coleman, with his permission. Um, as breathing gets, you know, why do we want to do this? All right, as your breathing muscles get weaker, muscles around the chest wall can get stiffer, lose their compliance. This can lead to kind of this smaller breaths, more frequent breaths, reduced lung volume. Speech can be impacted because you don't have the breath to get the full sentences out or to increase your loudness or project. Swallowing can be impacted because you may need to be taking breaths more frequently, which disrupts that really delicate balance I talked about between airway open, airway closed. All right, that breathing and swallowing coordination. All right, how do you do it? Again, I'm gonna refer back to Dr. Coleman's talk um, where he included a fantastic video by Stephanie Hesser showing how to do it. You use an Ambu bag to sequentially stack breaths on top of each other. So you're getting more lung volume with, with each breath. This helps to improve your lung expansion. Better lung expansion equals more breath for talking with greater force and can potentially get you greater utterance length. This can improve the strength of <clears throat> that throat clearing or cough, which is a protective response. And some studies have shown that the results can last for 30 minutes or more. All right. So this kind of brings me into kind of talking about what, you know, how we maximize our respiratory support uh, to help with speech and swallowing function. All right, again, referring back to Dr. Coleman's talk, non-invasive ventilation, you know, BiPAP can help kind of rest your, your diaphragm, um, gives you that greater support so that you may have more energy and more volume for speaking and better coordination of that airway closure for swallowing. Using mouthpiece or SIP ventilation, again, Dr. Coleman had a great video in his talk using SIP ventilation, that can give you that extra boost of air when you need it that can be used during speaking or during swallowing. Airway clearance is really important as well as buildup of saliva can impact your swallow function if you've got too much gunk in there already and your speech it can in, impact your speech clarity. All right, so using things like a vest or a cough assist, those can also be important you know, respiratory interventions that also help speech and swallowing. Again, I'm gonna go back to that breath stacking, that lung volume recruitment. In a study that was done on that using 29 people with ALS, they found that it did improve that throat clearing, uh, the hawking response, be able to get something up out of your throat if you need to, uh, and the super superglottic swallow, which is kind of an airway closure, sort of a voluntary airway closure during your swallow. They did see a difference in that peak cough flow 
And the important thing here is the improvements were seen to last 30 minutes after the treatment. So this is why it's important to think about doing that before a meal to see if we get some you know, prolonged improvement over the course of at least part of your meal. All right, just a little bit here on saliva control and management. You know, saliva control, if we have drooling, if we've got saliva pooling in your mouth, um, again, it can impact speech, it can impact swallowing. Changes in viscosity, we can get these thick secretions that are really hard to clear out. It impacts your quality of life, you're constantly using suction or dabbing um, you know, with a handkerchief because there's a lot of saliva. There are ways we can manage this. One, we may wanna make sure you're getting adequate hydration, all right? Dehydration can increase that thickness in saliva. If you have a suction machine at home, if not, figure out how to get you a suction machine at home, that can help if you have really kind of copious or excessive secretions. Using different types of medications that can help dry this out. You will work with your physician on this to figure out the balance and the right medication for you. Um, there are gonna be injections with Botox that can help control really excessive saliva and even radiotherapy for excessive saliva. Different options that you can discuss with your physician. Our dietitians had mentioned um, certain types of uh, juices like pineapple, papaya, uh, red grape juice have um, an enzyme in them that actually helps break down the protein that can make saliva really thick. So using something like that can help as well. Um, you know, kind of in summary here, um, you know, your speech therapist can be very useful in helping you manage the challenges that you may be experiencing with your speech, communication, your swallowing. We're gonna provide realistic information about what's going on now, what can possibly go on in the future, and how do we address it each step of the way. Um, and work on different strategies, managing the challenges and working with you, number one, and then collaborating with your physician, nurses, our dietitians, our OTs. Um, how can we you know, help keep speech and swallowing and communication you know, optimized? And staying abreast of what, what else is out there, what's coming out, what, what new exercises may be appropriate, um, you know, what can we what can we recommend? Um, I want to say, you know, just real briefly here with swallowing at some point in time, yes, oftentimes people may need to consider some supplemental feeding through a gastrostomy tube. One important thing to keep in mind there is if you are still able to safely swallow any consistencies of food or liquid, you may still be able to take these foods and liquids for pleasure, even if you're taking some of your nutrition or most of your nutrition through a gastrostomy tube. We can work with you to figure out kind of that balance and how to continue taking you know, oral intake by mouth pleasurably and safely. Thank you very much. I've got some references on here. Um, and I'm gonna turn you back to uh, Lauren. If you have any questions, I'll stay on for a few minutes to answer some questions. Otherwise you can get them to the Les Turner Association. They will get those questions to me. So again, I thank you all so much for listening to me for this hour. I know I gave you a lot of information. I hope it was useful. That was unbelievably comprehensive, uh, Kristen. I learned so much about it. I think you were so specific in terms of the strategies and the different exercises, and it wasn't just like one strategy. You offered so many different options. And I think that's so important for people because one may not work for everyone. And you uh, provided a beautiful segue into our next webinar next month, which I'm gonna talk about. So I think it's just beautifully complimentary. So, um, Thank you so much. Let's let's see if we got any questions. Um, I'm not seeing any in the chat box. If anybody would like to take the opportunity to send a question, please type it in the chat box. Um, I was emailed a question earlier today, actually two. Um, Kristen, I know that you talked at the end about the way to reduce the production of saliva. You'd mentioned uh, having adequate uh, hydration, the suction option certain medications, injections, radiotherapy, and some specific juices. Is there anything else you might add to that list? I think that's a pretty comprehensive list. And what I would definitely recommend if anyone's having issues with saliva, mention it to your physicians. Um, again, we try to balance uh, you know, having 
drying up excessive saliva without overdoing it because we don't want to create an overly dry mouth, which can you know cause other problems and sure. also make it harder to chew and swallow. So there's a, it's a fine balance. Work with your physician. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Kristen. Um, the second question that was emailed to me was, my jaw locks from time to time with my tongue getting caught and it's painful. I wear a mouth guard at night, but even then the inside of my cheeks get bitten. I do take lorazepam, but do you have any other suggestions? Okay, so it sounds like you, you've already maybe consulted with your dentist because anytime it's jaw issues, I would always recommend, you know, talk with your physicians and consult with your dentist. Um, biting the sides of your cheek, it sounds like this might be overnight. And unfortunately, I. I don't know of any way that I can that we can work to reduce that. Um, I will go back and say if you are biting your the sides of your cheek or your tongue while you're eating, one of the things you know, it's kind of the easiest thing we can do uh, may not always work. Slow down, be really careful. Um, it, maybe eat some foods that are a little softer or cut them into very small pieces to minimize that chewing burden. Uh, the less you're chewing, the less, and you, know, you can do it slowly and carefully, and hopefully minimize uh, any, you know, chomping on the side of your mouth. Because I know that is so yeah. painful. <laughs> and hopefully, even those those small suggestions can make the biggest difference. So, uh, well, I'm not seeing any more questions, Kristen. But thank you so much. We truly appreciate. Um, this is such valuable information for the individuals and families we serve. And it was such a pleasure having you. Um, thank you so much. And I will close off the um, webinar with a few, with some additional information and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, Kristen. All right. That was fantastic. I hope everyone enjoyed that. There'll be a survey for you to answer at the end. So we'd really love to hear from you. Um, I wanted to invite you again, I mentioned next month, we're gonna be having a webinar on Thursday, September 30th at noon. And we're gonna be talking about communication uh, with your existing technology. So please join us for that. And then in October, we'll be talking about family planning and ALS. And that'll be taking place Thursday, October 7th at noon. And you don't wanna miss that. Um, you may be familiar with Lisa Kinsley. She gave a, uh, a uh, webinar earlier in the year on um, genetics and ALS. And then please join us for our annual Walk for Life happening in person this year, September 18th, 2021. To learn more or to register, please visit alswalkforlife.org. And last but not least, our annual symposium happening on November 1st will feature presentations from leading ALS clinicians and researchers, including members of, members of our Lois and Salia ALS clinic at our Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern Medicine. Dr. Brown has a longstanding research, research interest in identifying gene defects that underlie, underlie ALS and related neuromuscular disorders. His laboratory team has used insights from these in investigations in genetics to generate cell and animal models of each of these disorders. Most recently, he has initiated trials of gene suppression therapy, SOD1, C9-ORF72, in human primates and now in humans. He has published more than 300 peer-reviewed reports and more than 70 reviews and chapters on these topics. Again, a special thank you goes out to Kristen Larson, Larson for sharing her expertise and her time with us today. And I thank all of you for joining us as well. We look forward to having you join us next month. Please take a minute to fill out the um, survey that you will receive immediately after we conclude because your feedback is important to us. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week.